And it looks like Dr. Harrison has joined us. Hi, Mark. Hi, Liz. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm great, thank you. Do you like the picture here that I have of you and your son on the left? I do, except I look really cold, which I was. That was one of the <laughs> coldest days ever. So tell us a little bit about, about that day. So Liz, um, the, the, the young man in the uh, pictures are baby Martin. Um, he, he's, I guess, 25 at the time. Uh, he's our younger son. And uh, we did the Bear Lake Triathlon. We both did the sprint distance race. And it was horrendous weather. Uh, but it was a big day uh, for both of us because it was his first triathlon <clears throat> that he did with me, that he's ever done with me. And for me, it was my first one uh, post-CAR-T therapy. And it was not an easy road to get there, but it was really, really special to share it with him. And he had flown, flown in from Boston to do it with me. That is awesome. What a great story. He's a, well, he's a good guy. Fantastic. Well, one of these days, um, I'll get my act together and maybe do a triathlon myself. Uh, let me know the date. I'll be there. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. All right. Well, um, so uh, we have about half an hour together. Great. And um, most of the people who attend our webinars um, are Intermountain Caregivers. Um, but it's a, it can be a diverse audience, um, including our patients and clients and community members. So if it's OK with you, I'd like to take just a minute and uh, introduce you with a brief biography. Thank you. Uh, that's okay. great. Excellent. Okay. So, uh, for those of you who don't know Dr. Harrison, and maybe as well as I do, he is president and CEO of Intermountain Healthcare. He is a pediatric critical care physician and a recognized national and international leader in healthcare transformation. His leadership has landed him on the Fortune Top 50 World's Greatest Leaders in 2019 and modern healthcare's most influential people in healthcare. In fact, he was number three in 2020. Dr. Harrison is leading Intermountain's 41,000 employees, who we refer to as caregivers, uh, to embrace bold new approaches to improve health, redefine value-based care, and serve people in new ways. He received his undergraduate degree from Haverford College, his medical degree from Dartmouth, he completed his pediatric residency and critical care fellowship at our own Intermountain Primary Children's Hospital. And he has a master's of medical management um, from Carnegie Mellon University. And as we know, Dr. Harrison is an All-American triathlete. He in fact represented the United States at the 2014 World Championships. And we'll hear more about the fact that he's a two-time cancer survivor and um, now has his sights set on competing in another Ironman. So welcome, Mark, to our inaugural Live Well webinar interview with an athlete. Well, I'm really honored. Thank you, Liz. It's a pleasure. So, Mark, we have a few questions that we've crowdsourced from various sources that we'd like to ask you tonight, if that's OK. Sure. Um, we're going to try and get through all of these in about 15, 20 minutes, so we leave some time for questions. And I would just ask for all of those who are attending the webinar, um, please put your questions in the chat and I will try and keep track of that. And we will ask as many of them at the conclusion as we have time for. So um, Mark, we know that you're a competitive triathlete. Uh, can you share with us how you ended up competing in this sport? So I, I probably should say I was a competitive triathlete. I, the cancer thing has really taken a toll on my speed, but. Um, at times, I've been a very competitive triathlete, let's put it that way. Maybe once again, who knows? Um, I'm not quite sure how I started. I, I know I started watching the NBC Ironman broadcast in the early 80s, and um, I, I just was fascinated by these crazy people who were so strong, and they seemed to be having fun and having an adventure all at the same time. And I've always loved playing outside, and I was a uh, kayaker and rock climber and I was a river guide and I did a bunch of other stuff and uh, right near a, a cottage that my family has there was a local triathlon that was in 1982 I had just graduated from high school and had spent the summer um, kayaking and working at a camp and I just decided to give it a go uh, with about a week's worth of preparation and absolutely loved it I loved the people um, I loved the setting. I loved how complicated it was to 
you know, try and knit these three sports together, boom, boom, boom. And um, I, that was it. Um, that was absolutely it. I just fell in love. And I started combing running magazines and bike magazines and looking for newsletters because, you know, everything was hard copy then, Liz, uh, to try and find that next race. And I actually have not missed a year of racing since 92, since 82. Uh, wow. Absolutely. Through kids and training and medical practice and some health up, ups and downs and living overseas, I've never missed a year. Cool. That's great. It's very inspiring. I think of triathlons as kind of the family medicine of sport, you know, somebody who likes <laughs> everything. <laughs> That's absolutely uh, jack of all trades, master of none or something yeah. like that, right? Although the elite athletes are so amazing, Liz. I mean, wow. they're turning in near world class times in each individual discipline and putting it together, it, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah, I've had the opportunity to um, present at the Ironman Sports Medicine Conference on several occasions. So I'm there for the Hawaii Ironman and um, uh, observing and um, and uh, working with uh, those athletes, those world class athletes. It's very impressive. You know, it's funny, Liz, I was um, I was the medical advisor for Triathlete Magazine for about five years. I'm not sure if you if you knew that. But no, I didn't. And. It's, I think it started sort of in the late 90s, and I wrote a monthly column for Triathlete. And it's funny because I, um, was at, I was at the start of a race, and I was w listening to people talk around me, and they were talking about one of the articles I had written, and, um, and it was about hypernatremia and endurance sport. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I realized that probably more people were reading my magazine articles than they were reading my um, academic articles that I was working so hard on. It's like, you know, I maybe need to rebalance my my efforts because I think I'm having more of an impact in the uh, in the right. popular media. I know. I feel that way when I write op-eds for the newspaper. There you go. So. Well, um, obviously, when you are participating in a sport that is as demanding as a triathlon, um, can you talk, I mean, because we're, this is the Live Well webinar, right? right? So can you talk a little bit about how you keep your body in tip-top shape? You know, talk about your training and your eating and your mental preparation, you know, with, for the sport. So back um, when I was young, um, I was naive and arrogant and um i couldn't imagine a day where i would actually need to stretch or i couldn't just like roll out of bed put my running shorts on and my shoes and head out the door um i very um arrogantly would say if you ask me about my diet um i'd just say look if the if the if the uh, furnace is hot enough anything will burn and um i did and let's just say that isn't true when you're 57 years old and, yeah. and in fact, my first Ironman um, was in 1987, and I was fast. I was 10:01, um, so it's a pretty fast race. I I did it completely on um, bananas and um, pop tarts. I was pretty sure that pop tarts were the were the optimal um, endurance. Ah! I know what a <laughs> jerk. So, um, at this point, I think I spend more time prehabbing and rehabbing than I do actually training. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm moderately careful with my diet. Uh, I eat whole foods. I eat very few processed foods, but I eat a wide variety of them. And I will on occasion, you know, have dessert or, you know, something, something other than fruit for dessert. But I, I think I just like, um, I like fresh foods and I eat a colorful plate and I eat lots of lean protein. Nothing too fancy, but I also don't eat a lot of garbage either. Yeah, I, I'm fond of the saying, you know, there are really no bad foods, just bad habits. And I think that's very true. Um, and I will confess that I, you know, I do enjoy um, a drink every now and then. And But again, everything in moderation. Yeah. And and I, I certainly notice if I don't eat well um, for a couple of days, my body just doesn't feel as good. Yeah, for sure. And as for far sure. as training goes, um, I probably at this point train about 15 hours a week. Uh, mm -hmm. which is a fair amount, you know, as I head towards an Ironman. But a lot of it at this point, Liz, probably at least three hours a week is strength training because as an mm -hmm. older athlete, 
you know, you don't want to lose muscle mass. You really don't want to lose muscle mass and you want to stay lean. And, um, a lot of the, um, um, a lot of my run mileage is actually hiking at this point, um, mm-hmm. because I find that it just, you, if I really push hard on the uphills, I can get a, an equivalent aerobic workout uh, and it makes me nice and strong and it doesn't bang me up the way certainly 20 mile runs on the road used to. Yeah, I'm, I, uh, I would say that I follow, have taken a similar path, uh, more strength training. And uh, this morning, my, my hike was more about how much vertical I could get rather than how much distance I could get. So I'm Sounds with you. Sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, you know, as I was reading your, your biography for our audience, um, again, it's, it's no secret that you're, you are a two-time cancer survivor. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, about, you know, and we've communicated by, on this by email before, you know, how did you adjust your training and, and what did you do differently, you know, as you were undergoing treatment um, and recovery from cancer? So the first time I had cancer uh, was now a little more than 10 years ago, and I had bladder cancer. And interesting, Liz, at least interesting to me, it showed up, um, um, I think, early enough to save my life because of an Ironman that I was doing. I had been training um, one summer, and uh, I just wasn't feeling well. Um, my training wasn't going well. I wasn't improving the way I should. And I still went um, to Ironman, Wisconsin. I had an okay race, but halfway through the run, I started to have hematuria. I started to pee blood. And I remember driving back to Cleveland. We were living there at the time. I called uh, my friend who's a urologist, and, um, and I said, hey, you know, I'm having this symptom. And he was very practical, and he thought what I thought, which is this is probably runner's bladder, where it's dehydrated, right. and my walls of my bladder were rubbing together, and I had a little bit of bleeding. And he said, if it lasts for another couple of days, come on in, and we'll scope you. And I remember lying on the cystoscopy um, table and looking at the at the TV monitor and going, that looks like a really nasty bladder cancer. Um, <laughs> and And he said, Mark, that looks like a really nasty bladder cancer. And Soon enough, um, um, I had had a radical cystectomy and a neobladder creation. And um, fortunately, I had clean margins. I was surgically cured. I didn't have chemotherapy or uh, radiation. And I, I got better. But um, actually, most people do not recover to a ha- an active life after that um, because it really messes up um, your um, sort of pelvic um, sort of kinesiology, muscle strength, Etc. But I did come back, and in fact, my goal had been to go to world championships. After that, uh, I said, "Look, I'll know I'm back if I can." And so it took about um, took about three or four years, and I qualified for worlds in Edmonton and uh, went there in 2014. And then uh, this multiple myeloma thing is has been really quite difficult. Um, so I uh, had chemotherapy and unfortunately failed it. Um, and needed a bone marrow transplant. I was penta resistant, including all the immunotherapies when I went to bone marrow transplant. And then at a hundred days, I uh, found out that I was, um, I still had cancer. The interesting thing is the weekend that I found out that I was still sick, I had actually come back from the bone marrow transplant and raced in a ski biathlon, uh, a uh, archery biathlon race. And, um, and actually won my age group and was third overall. And um, was doing that while I still, still had myeloma um and you're a good shot huh has a pretty good shot not the fastest <laughs> skier that weekend <laughs> and uh ended up needing a, to find an experimental therapy so i went to a phase two trial and through all of this um i just kept training so when i went to bone marrow transplant i took um, a bike and a trainer to the hospital and in my room i would ride um when i had car t therapy um it was in the middle of a pandemic as well. I had I had some weights and a uh, treadmill in my room. Now I couldn't do much. I was really sick, um, but it was probably as much mental as anything to just keep moving forward. And I got into the point where my quote strength work was kind of rolling around on the floor, which was all, all I could do. Um, but if I, I look back at my training log, and pretty much every day I do something. And um, I think it helped me keep my sanity as much as anything. 
Well, you know, uh, you know, I had reached out to you at that time. I have a, a friend, you know, who um, is going has gone through a bone marrow transplant, and it was really, you know, the inspiration for you having exercise equipment in your room that helped me connect her with exercise equipment um, at Huntsman, you know, when she went through her bone marrow transplant. So, you know, it's inspiring to know that, you know, even when people are having something as as hard and as devastating as that. Um, that you you know can still um, you know get some activity safely and um, and do it like you said nothing else for the mental part. And I know you know this, Liz, but there's actually pretty good um, literature that suggests that uh, the fitter you are going into these kind of events, actually, the better you do. And um, and I, that was very important to me. But maybe as much as that, you know, some people have very active spiritual lives that they express through organized religion. Um, I express my spiritual life through moving my body um, and um, connecting with the world in, in that kind of way. And I guess it makes sense. You know, people practice yoga and it's a spiritual experience. But whether it's breath or movement, um, it actually, I think, has helped keep me whole through a lot of really quite uh, challenging times. Yeah. Well, that's a good segue to kind of my next my next question. Um, and uh, I'm going to I'm going to read this so I get it right. Um, but I had read this story that said, if you want to be a CEO later, play sports now. And uh, it went on to say that a disproportionate number of CEOs played sports when they were younger. And uh, the CEO of Whole Foods was captain of the Stanford soccer team. Um, He's a good guy. Oh, I, I don't know him, but I'll, I'll, I like yeah. Whole Foods. Um, and that Ernst & Young had done some studies and they found that it's even more common for female executives uh, to uh, have participated in competitive sports. Um, and they did a study with 821 high level executives and found that 90% of women sampled had played competitive sports and among women holding C-suite positions that proportion rose to 96 percent. So I thought I'd ask you can you talk about how being a competitive athlete influences your role as CEO of Intermountain Healthcare? So I think the um, the standard interpretation of this information and by the way this is true I mean I know people who are um, you know, world-class athletes, um, America's Cup sailors on Olympic teams, you know, all that kind of stuff. There is a, there's an overlap. And the standard interpretation is that these are competitive people um, and that CEOs are inherently competitive. And we probably are, but um, I actually interpret it differently. I think it's about grit and I think it's about showing up every day. Um, there is no high-level athlete that doesn't suck it up every day and do what they need to do to, to stay in the game. And Liz, if you're a serious athlete, you lose a lot. I mean, you get good at losing and um, as well as winning and you are able to get up in the morning and say, okay, I lost yesterday. What am I going to do today to be a little bit better athlete, person, et cetera. And, um, I actually think that's probably more important than the competitive part. I think it's persistence. And, you know, you, you may know that our family motto is relentless forward progress. <laughs> and um, and um, we, we live that. And, um, and I think that takes you a long way with, you know, maybe moderate talent. It takes you a long way. Yeah. You know, I, I thought the same thing, you know, when I um, read this article, um, that it's, you know, persistence and resilience you know, that really are at the core of that, that, that the, the athlete uh, mind um, helps to support that, that development and success as a CEO. So I would agree. Well, I, I wanted to, um, you know, conclude my questions with something that I know is really important to you. And that is that Intermountain has adopted a new fundamental around equity. And, you know, I think that this is so important, you know, as a sports medicine physician, you know, um, I have I have uh, covered sports as a team physician, you know, from um, I covered Golden Gloves boxing 
in Minneapolis when I was a sports medicine fellow. And not because I knew anything about boxing, but because in the underserved area of Minneapolis where I did my fellowship, that was the sport the kids participated in. And I wanted to support that, you know, all the way up to covering you know, professional sports and Olympic athletes. So can you talk about, you know, um, as it relates to equity, you know, how does, you know, I don't know, how can each caregiver maybe adopt that athlete mindset? And where does equity kind of fit into sports from your perspective? So um, the thing that every caregiver can do that's really simple, um, actually there are two things. Uh, the first thing they can do is they can realize because one person does better um, doesn't mean that anybody loses. Um, I think there's a zero sum mindset that can actually be a real negative, Liz, where you know, if you're going to provide additional opportunity for one person, by definition, folks think that somebody else is going to do worse. And it's just not so. Um, this is really about making the, the pie bigger. And, you know, we have more people who start businesses and have professions and become teachers. It, it becomes a virtuous a cycle of virtuosity, right? You know, we're things are getting better and better for, for them and their fam for families and for future generations. Uh, and then the second thing that people can do um, is they can listen to somebody else's story. E everyone's got a story. And, um, and people who look um, like they maybe have, they're not diverse. If you actually ask them, there's almost inevitably something in their family that makes them feel unique. Maybe they grew up in a really rural area and they don't feel understood by city people. Maybe they have um, a Native American ancestor that they may not look like it, but they feel connected to that heritage. I think listening to people and understanding their uniqueness, um, if we did that more for one another, I think the world would be a little bit better place. And as far as sport goes, um, you know, I love that when, when you do a sport, people you do it with, and sometimes you're competing against them, or often you are, but you're often doing it with them as well. It's, it's, um, it's, it's a level experience. Um, you get to see them in ways that are just really raw and human. You see their good days and their bad days. And our oldest um, kid was a, quite a good wrestler. We, he grew up in Northeast Ohio where wrestling is huge. Yeah. Right? And um, he was good enough to go to districts all four years in, in, um, in high school, never made it to states. Uh, but he wrestled against all these kids from all different kinds of backgrounds. And um, there was something just really powerful about going to these meets and seeing the families and how they were different colors and spoke different languages sometimes and clearly came from a variety of socioeconomic backgrounds. What did they have in common? They loved their kids. And they were passionate about the sport and um, we were all in it together. And it, it, it felt really um, inclusive in a way that I just loved. Because I think sport offers a really unique glimpse into other people's lives. Yeah, I would agree. You know, there's a, a, a sports medicine physician who I looked up to for a very <clears throat> long time, you know, who, like myself, is also a family physician, you know, and his one of his um, philosophies is to treat every patient like an athlete you know and um, that uh, there to your point there's always you know something some activity that people are doing and it well, frankly it, it may or may not be competitive I certainly still consider myself an athlete um, and uh, I don't really compete doing anything these days except maybe try and do my uh, trail run a little bit faster and without getting injured. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think that, you know, part of this and part of the reason why we've included the interview with an athlete in our Live Well webinar series is this idea about kind of demystifying the athlete, that we're all athletes, right? And that um, we're athletes in our own way. And we want everyone to be, you know, physically active. We know that that's one of the strongest levers to pull when it comes to improving health. Um, and you know, it's a it's foundational to a healthy lifestyle. And I think you really. It is. 
I think it creates these, um, I think the personal connection piece is really good for one's emotional health as well. Um, probably my, my very closest friends are sporting friends and I've had them for decades. Um, and, uh, they're from all different backgrounds. I mean, um, you know, some of them are successful in a conventional sense, others are not, but they're all successful in terms of being a good friend and a, um, somebody who I can rely on. And I think they can rely on me as well. And we sure get a lot of pleasure out of doing things together still. Maybe a little slower than we used to <laughs> and a little creakier in the morning when we get out of bed, but um, lots of lots of great bonding experiences over the years. Yeah. Well, um, I want to be respectful, too, of some of the people who have joined us today. And um, I'm going to uh, ask a question that came from Jessica Shields, um, who's a, a dietitian and works in the Office of Health Promotion and Wellness. And she's asking, um, what advice would you give to someone who's just starting up, maybe a little apprehensive about joining activities because they don't view themselves as an athlete? You know, I'd, I'd, I'd probably give um, a couple pieces of advice. And one is just get started and um, let go of your expectations of yourself and just be present and, and get moving. And the other is to try and find a mentor. Um, and I don't, and that mentor does not need to be expert, but it can be a, an emotional mentor or support person who you can do something with. One, one of the biggest, um, and, and Liz, I know you know this literature, but you know, in, in order to not um, skip activities, if you have a friend to meet, um, it really um, increases the likelihood that you're going to follow through. And by the way, um, that friend can be a dog. Uh, there's actually pretty good dog literature, yes. right? That yes. Who have dogs? Um, they get out and they walk and they run and they hike, and um, because their their dog expects them to. So I, I'd say just get started. One of the things that's been freeing this year, um, as I train for Ironman, is that I have absolutely let go of expectations. As far as we can tell. Um, there's nobody who's been through what I've been through who's ever completed an Ironman. Um, actually, I, we can't find anybody online who's been through bone marrow transplant and CAR-T and, um, um, and, and completed any length of triathlon. So I've already done that. So I have no time goals. I want to, I guess I do. I want to slide in under 17 hours in Hawaii in October. That would be a huge win. Um, but it's been really good to just give up on the objective measures of success and just be and just do this thing that's awesome that is awesome um jessica added uh good advice and my dog is certainly more disciplined about our morning runs than i am <laughs> <laughs> me too and my my dog and i hit the trail at about 5 50 this morning so um isn't it she's great running partner yeah our our dog is actually getting a little older and so i've got to be careful with her but she does not like to be left behind that's for sure oh no they don't they don't well you know mark thank you so much for joining us today i mean it's such an inspiring story and there's been several comments in the chat you know again about how inspiring this is and i i knew you were the perfect person to kick off our interview with the athlete series and um you know it's it's wonderful to hear your story and um and, and your persistence and your grit and your resilience in face of, of all that you've gone through in terms of your health. So thank you for, for being such a great example. Um, you know, I, I kind of feel a little bit like Charles Barkley did when he goes like, I'm not a role model, right? I think he got in a lot of trouble for saying that. Um, and I, I, I hope it's, it would be really nice if I could inspire some folks, but that's really not why I do this. Um, you know, it's, it's who I am. And, um, you know, I, I hope that everybody who's listening finds a way to fully express their authentic self, whatever that is, yeah. musician, artist, mother, father, professional, just be you and um, be the best you you can be. And it's all you can do, right? Yeah, right on. All right, great words to uh, conclude our Live Well webinar. Thanks everyone for joining us. Please join us on July 7th. Have a great evening and thanks again, Mark. Thanks, Liz. What a what a privilege. Thank you. Bye-bye.